you should know, Chris, this is not like, oh, I'm going to talk about this and forget about it. Like this bothers me and I'm not going to rest until something changes. Well, Mr. Yang, certainly appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you so much. No problem, Chris. Glad to be here. Well, I think you turned a lot of heads this week when you called out WWE, Vince McMahon specifically, for their, quote, ridiculous classification of WWE wrestlers as independent contractors while controlling their name and likeness. For you, what, what's so ridiculous about this? I actually got a message from, uh, from someone uh, who was part of the WWE pointing out to me the story about how WWE was saying, hey, don't go on Cameo or Twitch. Uh, and it infuriated me because I know that the WWE has been trying to play it both ways for years, where they're saying on one hand, can't do anything without our say-so, you, we own you, but you're an independent contractor and we have nothing to do with your health, retirement, um, uh, any of the benefits you'd get that would accrue to an employee. So to me, you, you have to make a choice at some point. If you're going to control all these aspects of a, a wrestler or performer's waking life, then you should take some responsibility too for that person, uh, bigger picture. Maybe like if they have a kid, maybe they get some uh, maternity or paternity leave, you know, maybe they get an off season, maybe they get recovery time. Uh, and I say this as someone who's been a long time fan of the sport. I know you know a lot of the performers well yourself. Yeah. Uh, they're putting their lives on the line not, or their health on the line, their family life on the line all the time. They've made Vince a billionaire. Uh, and then the fact that he's still being so heavy handed about their ability to make a simple buck on Cameo just struck me as so absurd and ridiculous and wrong. Uh, and I've been on the side of MMA fighters who are in the similar boat, frankly, with the UFC and Dana White. Yeah. Uh, and because I got this note from this uh, performer, I said, you know, like it's past time that someone calls Vince out for this, particularly because if Joe and Kamala win, I may be in a position to do something about it. So I think a lot of people were looking at this from the outside going, this guy's a politician. I mean, what does he know? But you're a lifelong wrestling fan. So like, who were some of the people that you looked up to growing up? Well, I'm a little older than you, Chris. So for me, uh, it was like the original 80s Hulkamania heyday. Uh, so my favorite wrestler was Macho Man Randy Savage. I was like a huge Macho Man guy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dig it. Uh, Ricky Steamboat I liked. Um, and then a little bit later on, there's a whole generation of performers I really liked that passed away quite early. So it was like Ravishing Rick Rude, Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig bunch of those guys where I was like, how can British Bulldog, like yeah. a lot of those guys, you're like, how the heck uh, are, are they dead? Like, I feel like I saw him just like the other month and he, you know, on TV and he looked great. Uh, I went to live events with my brother who was also a fan. So I saw Andre the Giant in person. I, I marveled at how enormous he was. Like, it felt like if you tuck yourself into a ball, you could, uh, <laughs> like somebody who were like throwing over his head. Um, so, yeah, like I was a, a real wrestling fan growing up, and I feel like every kid in the 80s was a wrestling fan, unless it was just my town. <laughs> where, where, no, no, this was everywhere. It was everywhere uh, in, in the 80s and 90s. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up with it. It was a family bonding experience. My dad took my brother and me to see WrestleMania four. the, uh, you know, and so things like that. It, it was incredible. Wow. So, so WWE kind of like tried to clarify these statements and basically compared themselves to Disney and Warner Brothers with their intellectual property. Do you think that's a fair comparison? I really do not, uh, because there, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that if uh, an actress or performer plays Belle from Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> that, that, that is not actually Belle. She does not live in a magic castle. <laughs> with, with the beast uh and so if the actress then turns around and does something of their own accord everyone knows it's you know talent for, for hire and she's doing something else uh and so with professional wrestlers you inhabit a character but you're still a human being uh and you still should be able to do things as any human <laughs> would do for example 
and make an appearance, show up on on Cameo, like do do things that take advantage of it. it like uh, it'd be if you, Chris, somehow were uh, in a movie and then all of a sudden you weren't allowed to turn around <laughs> and do anything as yourself. Right. Uh, so so I think that the comparison is not very apt uh, in large part because the treatment is so uh, uh, is so uh, again, it, it's so dissonant because on one hand you're saying look we have no responsibility for you but on the other hand uh we control your very image your name in some cases uh, and you can't do anything without our say so uh, it, it in no a way it's actually inhuman it's dehumanizing it's saying like look you are no longer a human being you are this character uh and i remember one of the pieces of evidence this will show what a fan i am uh, of how off big Vince is, is you remember when he busted out like the fake razor Ramon and the fake diesel? Of when, course. Uh, yeah. That Hall and Kevin Nash went to yeah. but, like that. That's literally how he thinks about it. It's like, I made you, I invented you. It's like, actually there are two dudes. <laughs> They're walking around. They work for your competitor and no one cares about these new fake characters that you're, uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're coming up with like, like without those individuals and the talent, um, the characters don't matter and they don't exist. Yeah, it's, it's just so interesting that like if Chris Hemsworth went and did something as Chris Hemsworth, we don't go, oh, there's Thor doing that thing. But in the wrestling world, like the, the lines are so blurred between the character and the person. Yeah, that, that's where I was going uh, with trying to draw a comparison with Disney. Uh, you know, it's like, like Disney doesn't own Emma Watson. <laughs> you know? right. it's, not like Emma, it's not like Emma Watson like shows up someplace and Disney's like, can't sign those autographs. Uh, you know, and, and that's the, so if they want to compare themselves, uh, you know, they, they should really rethink um, their values in large part because if you do look at someone like Emma Watson or Disney or Warner, guess what? They're members of the Screen Actors Guild and they yeah. have tons of benefits. Like if you want to go that direction, Vince, then you'd have to, you'd, you'd, have, you'd have to completely change how you treat your workers, which is a legitimate go. And, and that would be one thing I would suggest is, look, if you want to control their name and likeness, guess what? Then they should be part of a union or a professional association. They should have benefits up to their eyeballs. And then you can have a conversation with them about some of their activities. But I guess someone on the flip side could say, well, they read the contract, they signed this, the performer agreed to this, so maybe they're on the hook for it. Well, one, I heard from a performer who's not happy with this particular uh, clarification or, or this particular the rule. Uh, but the truth of it is that there's a vastly uneven bargaining table at work where if you're a performer, and WWE says, hey, here's this contract, and we're going to stick a bunch of things in it that you think are unfair or ridiculous or exploitative. At the end of the day, you feel like you have no choice but to sign that deal because yeah. WWE holds the keys to the kingdom. You know, they are the largest company, they're the surest means to elevate your career, uh, and there hasn't been a genuinely competitive market for years it's one reason why I, like many other fans, naturally root for AEW to succeed and create a genuine uh, competitive market so that wrestlers don't get exploited. But the reality is that WWE is a quasi-opoly uh, and imagining that these wrestlers, oh, they know what they got into. It's like, well, they didn't really have a genuine uh, chance to negotiate a bargain. So, I mean, you've been very complimentary towards AEW. What do you think that they're doing correct or are they moving in the right direction here? It feels like they are. And I actually talked to the talent in AEW too, uh, and they like it. They say they're being well-treated and uh, they have a degree of freedom in terms of their ability to take other bookings. Um, it seems like it's an organization that has performers and talent very much at the ownership structure or at a minimum, they have a ton of input. Um, so, and they understand who they're competing against too. So if you have WWE, you have like the Vince uh, empire, it's very, very top down and you know, you have no choice. And then they are the employee led alternative. And I think they take that seriously. So I was thrilled to hear from performers at AEW that um, they feel great about it. You know, and it's a, it's a, it seems like it's a very different approach.
So what can change? I mean, if this is a corrupt labor practice, as you call it, what can change? Oh, a lot can change. Because <laughs> if you look at it, uh, the, the WWE, to me, has a, has a choice. It's, look, we're going to treat you as an independent contractor, so you can do whatever you want on your off time. And we don't have uh, all of this say-so over a lot of your activities. Um, or you can start treating them like your employees, which they are, uh, and you introduce real benefits, including a real union or professional association and real negotiation. And if you saw that happen, then I, I think very quickly you'd have a lot of performers uh, come out of the woodwork and say, if they weren't fearful, frankly, of losing their job or their spot yeah. in the roster or, or, or their livelihoods, uh, where they would, they would say, I would love it if we had some recovery time, better health care, my, that my incentives weren't to go out there hurt all the time, uh, then you could see a real transformation. Uh, and to me, it needs to be on the table. It's long overdue. Uh, you had folks like Jesse Ventura trying to uh, organize this sort of thing uh, before, but Vince has always managed to just like keep the ball moving, you know, like nothing to see here, nothing to see here. But I can promise you that uh, if I'm a part of the Biden administration uh, that and I can do something about this, I will. You have a National Labor Relations Board that officially has purview over this. And right now it's Trump appointees and they're not going to do a thing. But if you had a different set of appointees looking at the labor practice of the WWE, to me, it's crystal clear that they can't have it both ways. And that right now performers are employees in everything but name. So are, are you looking to perhaps become a part of this? You looking to become the labor secretary? Uh, well, I, I'll do uh, one of a number of things uh, if Joe and Kamala will have me. But one of the things I said in my tweet was like, look, even if I'm not the labor secretary, can I call the labor secretary? Will I know that person? Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, can I call the people who are the new appointees to the National Labor Relations Board? Yes. Like, will, will I... Will I forget about this? Hell no. And that's part of it is that like Vince and the gang, they buy because they're like, well, the mainstream press won't pay any attention to it because it's wrestling. Uh, and the wrestlers can say a damn thing because they know we'll uh, come down on them like a ton of bricks. So let's just keep exploiting people and making our millions uh, and we'll just get away with it for decades and decades. Uh, and the bill's coming due. Uh, I'm going to be the person that does it or the person that is there when it's done. Uh, and it's going to give me great pleasure because like I said, that people know. I grew up a fan, I'm sick and tired of seeing my childhood heroes die early uh, and then not knowing whether their families had any reasonable means of support thereafter. Uh, I'm sick of having this feeling in my stomach where when you see these performers uh, put themselves on the line that some of them aren't getting what they deserve. Uh, and as a fan, we deserve better. It's like, you know, we deserve to be able to support these performers with a clean conscience, knowing that they're doing great, their families are doing great, and they don't necessarily feel like they need to perform hurt if their body uh, requires some kind of break or recovery. I feel like this is a great promo. You'd be great. You, you should step in the ring. You should, uh, you should cut a promo, be part of a storyline. <laughs> That's, uh, well, this story is dead real. So, uh, and I, I will say though that there are uh, a lot of effective storylines that kind of melded reality with uh, fiction. So, to the extent that this ends up being part of a narrative, uh, I'd be open to it because I think the fans know. The fans are smart. The fans understand what's going on. It's one reason why a lot of people support AEW is that they they get this negative vibe from the WWE about the way the talent's being treated. And you can tell that you can tell that has nothing to do with the bottom line anymore because the McMahons have made so much money. Like they, they have enough money where they're like investing in these, uh, you know, like football leagues and whatnot. And then the XFL failed again, you know, it's like, kind of like you know, so if, if you're a wrestler breaking your back uh, and then the WWE is like, oh, we can't afford you. You're like, you're fired. It's like, well, you probably could have afforded me if you could afford to lose tens of millions on that debacle. Uh, and so that the, the, like the affordability argument does not apply to the WWE in a way that it applies to every other firm. If you look at AEW, I have a feeling that their economics are real. 
Um, but the the WWE does not have that those constraints anymore because it's a public company. Yeah. You know, like the the McMahons are now worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, they spend it on all sorts of stuff. I'm going to should have looked this up prior to our call. Do you happen to know the the WWE's market cap? Uh, well, I think that Vince. Well, we can look this up, but I think that Vince is uh, is worth 1.7 billion. So I don't know if. Yeah, and the company is worth 3.3 billion. And so if your company is worth 3.3 billion uh, and you're mistreating workers, you know, yeah. I mean, that's just shameful. Really, it's shameful. Uh, like there, there was a point in the distant past where you could have made a legitimate argument based upon cost, but now you can't. Now it's just plain fucking greed. Uh, and <laughs> so, so we can all see it. Like fans know. Um, so it's, it's one reason why a lot of people want there to be fair treatment of wrestlers and genuine competition in the market. So as we wrap this up, I'm curious to know what your favorite match of all time is. This, this may date me, but it, like, I remember Macho Man, uh, Steamboat, WrestleMania 3, just being this <sighs> mind-blowing match. As a kid. An all-time great. Yeah, uh, and because I was a Macho Man fan, um, in part because of that match. And then, so he loses that match, but he somehow gets elevated from it because it was so good. <laughs> and then he goes on to become the champion and uh, I loved the Macho Man title run. It made me very sad when, uh, as a kid, I was pretty young. Uh, but when they gave the title back to Hulk Hogan uh, the following year, I was like, no, <laughs> I thought we were past this. <laughs> and then it came back. Uh, so that, that match sticks out for me. I just want to thank you for taking the time to talk about this, to talk a little wrestling here. And look, I know this is the craziest time of year for what you do. So thanks for carving out some time for this. No problem. It's important. You know, like what happens to these performers uh, is a really big deal. Uh, and it's an emblem of what's gone wrong in the economy writ large, where if you have money on one side and people on the other, the money's winning, the people are losing. Uh, and if you can change that in any context, you, you have to do it. Uh, and if we can do this for wrestlers, it would actually be a very powerful signal. Uh, and you should know, Chris, this is not like, oh, I'm going to talk about this and forget about it. Like this bothers me and I'm not going to rest until something changes. So, you know, if you're in the industry and you're looking at this, like you should just try and make these changes without, frankly, uh, me and the government forcing you to. And then maybe you can claim like you did the right thing. If wrestlers want to reach out to you to talk to you about this, is that a possibility? Yeah, the, the easiest thing to, is to get me on Twitter. I'm pretty good on it. Well, that's how this happened. So again, thank you for your time, Mr. Yang. Uh, and yeah, this, this has been fantastic. Appreciate the heck out of you, Chris. Stay good. Well, there we go. Huge thank you to Andrew Yang for making the time to do this during the busiest, craziest time of year for him. Super grateful that he was able to carve out some time for this. And a big thank you to you for hanging out for this conversation. And if you haven't yet, please... Click subscribe so you don't miss out on any more conversations just like this. And who knew that Andrew Yang was such a big wrestling fan? Hard to disagree with his favorite match of all time. Steamboat versus Macho Man. That is an all-time classic. Also, hard to disagree with everything that he's talking about here. If wrestlers truly are independent contractors, it, it just seems to make sense that they should be treated as such. Drop a comment below. Let me know what you think about all this.